Alright, so we're in the book of Philemon, chapter 1. It happens to only be one chapter. So you can just call it Philemon or Philemon 1. But there's 25 verses that we're going to go through here. Uh, as always, uh, at least when I start a chapter, I kind of give an overview, as most everybody does. So an overview of Philemon is that this letter, or this epistle, some people may call it, uh, is not, this letter isn't really written to a church in general, like many of the other letters that Paul has written, such as Colossians, or Corinthians, or Ephesians. But this letter to Philemon is more of a personal, private letter, uh, again, to an individual, basically from Paul, who's in Rome at this time, we believe, uh, sending this letter to Philemon, a Christian slave owner in Col Col Colossae. Is where Philemon and his house is at. So this letter is basically a, a plea, Paul's plea, that Onesimus, Onesimus is one of the slaves of Philemon, who apparently has run away, and who also apparently has possibly stolen something. We don't really told explicitly what that might have been. So it may have been money, or it may have been property, of some sort, but obviously he couldn't take too much property with him when he decided to leave. Um, and so, it, it, again, we're not told explicitly what it was. So, uh, Philemon, he's hosting a church. Uh, this letter actually speaks of this church that uh, Philemon is hosting in his home. And as I mentioned, Onesimus was a slave and his master was Philemon. So those are the main players that we're going to hear over and over in this book. Uh, Paul is the author, uh, Philemon is the slave owner, and Onesimus is the slave that, uh, what's, I can't think of the right word, he providentially uh, makes his way away from Colossae, makes his way to Rome, I'm going to speak about maybe why he went to Rome, and he hooks up with Paul, uh, all part of God's plan, essentially. So Onesimus ran away, he possibly stole something. He fled to Rome, which is about a thousand miles away from Colossae. Uh, estimates say that there might have been about 64 million slaves in the Roman Empire. Not just in Rome, but in the Roman Empire. Um, so this, the Roman Empire at this time was, was quite large. Um, there was obviously Roman citizens and slaves in the Roman Empire. And it's by far the slaves outnumbered the Roman citizens. Uh, it said, from some information that I heard and found, was some wealthy landowners, it was possible that they owned 10 to 20,000 slaves. So 10 to 20,000 slaves just by individual landowners. So that's how you can see we could easily get to 60 million slaves uh, in and around Rome in the empire. And the slaves, as you might imagine, the stories that you've heard, uh, a lot of times they were treated pretty harshly, um, uh, but not all the time. They were considered possessions, um, and they could be abused, as you might imagine. And there was one story that I came across as I was listening to a certain pastor teach that um, I think the, way, the reason that this story was recorded was because Caesar Augustus was at this party that this wealthy landowner was hosting. And apparently, it wasn't a pool per se, but it was more along the lines of like a um, aquarium that must have been on the property where they were having this outdoor party um, that Caesar Augustus was uh, invited to. But apparently, this wealthy landowner took one of his slaves and threw this, this his slave into this aquarium, and quickly this slave started to become eaten alive by. Don't ask me why, but he had an aquarium full of more eels. So it was just kind of a, oh, watch what happens when I do this. It was maybe feeding time, and he took a slave and fed it to his eels, essentially. And it was recorded, you know, after that, and how disgusted Caesar Augustus was at that. And that's kind of why the story was probably recorded. But that's how brutally some slaves could have been treated uh, back in the day. But it, that wasn't all the time the way they were treated that harshly. So, but I, I can imagine all the stories that you've heard about slaves being brutally uh, abused uh, was true, um, but not always, not all slaves were treated that way. 
Uh, many slaves actually were given opportunities for education and to become um, owners themselves of other property. So that was a, a good thing. <clears throat> but obviously you had to write, have the right land owner uh, to be put in that situation where you wouldn't be brutally, or brutally uh, treated. So Paul, uh, over the course of time, has now encountered uh, Onesimus in Rome and ends up leading him to faith in Jesus Christ. So that's uh, also something that we'll look at. This personal letter, along with the letter to Colossians, uh, end up, ends up getting carried back to Colossae uh, by Onesimus. So let's go to uh, Colossians, that book, chapter 4, verses 7 to 9 where we see Onesimus being mentioned. So there's quite a few names that, that I'm going to read in some scripture passages here. Hopefully I don't butcher them too cruelly. Um, but I think we've all kind of heard them spoken by pastors here um, in church um, or someone else. So I'm kind of going off of those familiar pronunciations. Um, if the Steve were here, he might be able to correct me on some of these pronunciations probably. Um, so, uh, Tychicus, a uh, beloved brother, faithful minister, and fellow servant in the Lord, will tell you all the news about me. I am sending him to you for this very purpose, that he may know your circumstances and comfort your hearts with Onesimus, a faithful and beloved brother who is one of you. They will make known to you all things which are happening here. So we see that mention of Onesimus in this letter to the Colossians that um, Onesimus and Tychicus end up taking from Paul back to Colossae. So with that brief um, overview of the book, we're going to jump into uh, Philemon, verse 1. Paul, a prisoner of Jesus Christ, and Timothy, our brother, to Philemon, our beloved friend and fellow laborer. So right off the bat, we see Paul mentioning that he's a prisoner. Here, more specifically, of Christ Jesus. He tells us that Timothy is there with him, there in Rome, again writing a letter to Philemon, not necessarily a, a church in general, but a personal private letter to Philemon um, is mentioned here. So he mentions a prisoner of Christ Jesus. So this is one of those um, uh, letters that we've heard called one of the prison epistles. And I got some of this information, not information, but kind of the cool phrasing to go from Blanked on his name. I moved to Alaska. Oh, yeah, Pastor Lee. Yeah. yeah, Pastor Lee um, shared this in one of his teachings a long time ago. But you know, if you try and re remember the phrasing for Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians, the order of the way they appear in the book, you could just kind of think of the first letter: "God eats pizza cold," or "Give every praise to Christ." So that was one thing that in the middle column there is where Pastor Lee. Um, kind of use that phrase, but then to also then go a little bit further and remember the prison epistles down in blue, the four prison epistles are Ephesians, Colossians, Philippians, and Philemon. You can continue with God eats pizza cold, but then even cold pizza, peace pleases. So I kind of like that. It just kind of sticks with me and keeps with the theme of pizza. Um, yeah, and maybe it's something that will help you remember the, the four prison epistles. Verse 2 and 3. <clears throat> well, it ends up here with, To Philemon, our beloved friend and fellow laborer, to the beloved Aphia, Ar Archippus, our fellow soldier, and to the church in your house. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So we don't know for sure who Aphia is, but many early church fathers speculators say that Aphia was Philemon's wife. And Archippus uh, was either Philemon's son or possibly an elder or pastor in the church there in Philemon's house. As it's mentioned right here, Paul knows that Philemon is kind of hosting a church in his home. <clears throat> Archippus may have also been a pastor in Philemon's house. We see a little bit of evidence of that here in Colossians 4 also. Verse 17, where it says, And say to Archippus, Take heed to the ministry which you have received in the Lord, that you may fulfill it. So again, that's not directly saying what Archippus' purpose was, 
but Paul was alluding to you know, him having a ministry. Um, so again, he was probably either an elder or the pastor in Philemon's home. Is what uh, many of us have, or what I could read about uh, was what, who these two people might be. So it could be uh, Philemon's wife and his son and or pastor. So we see back here in this verse how Paul is just kind of we're going to see this in several verses where Paul is kind of not, you know, in our common vernacular, we would say he's kind of schmoozing. He's kind of buttering up uh, to Philemon because uh, he's working towards a big ask here in a little bit and towards the middle of this chapter <clears throat> where he's going to be asking Philemon to receive back into his home, back into, basically he's a runaway slave, so the slave does need to be return home to his slave owner at the risk of being killed if he doesn't. So Paul knows this, so he's going to end up sending him back. He's wanting, and Paul is wanting Philemon to actually welcome um, Philemon back in a gracious way, and not be mad necessarily at Onesimus for running away. So I say here, Paul's working all angles to the best of his ability on Onesimus' behalf by calling Philemon's wife uh, beloved. So that was kind of a, a nice touch uh, that he did there to the beloved Aphia, which again we believe is probably Philemon's wife. And notice he says here towards the end of this verse 3, a grace to you and peace from God our Father. As we've heard um, shared in many other teachings before, you know, grace always come, comes before peace. And it's something that we should also remember that peace is dependent on grace, not on our circumstances. So if we can recall and remember that, you know, that grace comes for first, uh, Ephesians 2, 8, grace, for by grace you have been saved through faith, faith. Um, so it's important to remember that grace comes first and then with grace, with you receiving, receiving grace, you may then have peace. And verses 4 through 6, I thank my God making mention of you always in my prayers hearing of your love and faith which you have toward the Lord Jesus and toward all the saints, that the sharing of your faith may become effective by the acknowledgement of every good thing which is in you, in Christ Jesus. So again here I say Paul is kind of buttering up Philemon a bit more by speaking of his love and faith toward the Lord Jesus Christ and towards others. So we can easily uh, gather from how Paul is writing this letter that he has heard from personal accounts, from friends, from people that have been and spent time with Philemon, as Paul has, because we're going to find out a little bit later in the end of this book that we believe Paul actually ends up, or had already led Philemon to Christ. So he was the one that brought Philemon to faith in Jesus Christ. And so he already knows Philemon, and he's also heard of how other people have been impacted by the love and grace and reception that Philemon has shared towards others. So Paul is just kind of making mention of that once again. <clears throat> and then Paul says, or makes mention that Philemon's faith shall become effective by acknowledging every good thing that is in himself, knowing that it has come from Jesus. And that's something that we all need to, to recognize and to know that everything good in us also comes from Jesus. And Paul is just kind of also asking to Philemon to recognize and to think and remember no, Philemon has been a Christian longer than Onesimus. So the same faith that Philemon already has, that Onesimus now has, Philemon is no better than Onesimus. All this time, Philemon may have been thinking of Onesimus as maybe nothing more than a slave. Um, but again, we don't know how well or how poorly Philemon may have been treating his slaves. But we know that, or Paul wants Philemon to, to take a step back and think, okay, Onesimus now is a fellow brother in Christ, as I am. And Paul is kind of pointing that out to Philemon to remember that when eventually Paul is going to be sending Onesimus back to Philemon. Philemon, Philemon. So uh, he's just kind of putting that seed into Philemon's ear by reading this passage. When he gets this letter, he's going to be reading it out loud and probably to his family and friends there, maybe in church. And um, 
Paul just wanted them to, to think hard on that, about how he receives Onesimus. Verse 7, For we have great joy and cons consolation in your love, because the hearts of the saints have been refreshed by you, brother. So here it is again, uh, Paul, you know, in our common vernacular, I would say that he's piling it on a little bit deeper now, Paul is. Uh, in a good way, though, Paul is just kind of, again, piling on, buttering up Philemon, and saying that Philemon is famous for his love towards others, which is a great thing, right? I mean, uh, if you were walking down the hallways and someone, you heard somebody over in the corner or sitting in the red chair somewhere just talking about, well, here comes Tom, or here comes Mike, or here comes Todd, and they're, they're, they were just talking about you, and they see you, and they wave you over and say, hey, we were just talking about you, about how you graciously did this, about how you did this, and how, how much of a comfort you were to this person. And those are good things to hear uh, about yourself, um, and, and hopefully you receive those well. And, um, and that's kind of what Paul is just kind of reiterating. Hey, Paul, hey Philemon, I've heard and I know how gracious you can be because other people have been refreshed by you. I've heard of that. I've seen that myself. So this is, a, again, Paul is really letting Philemon know that the work that he's done, the ministry that he's in, he's appreciated. So this is a good thing that Paul is saying about Philemon. And, you know, Paul says that others are refreshed by them spending time with Philemon. So it's always a good thing that we want to... Uh, have that type of recognition, you know, after we have spent time with somebody, hopefully those people can leave that conversation, leave that interaction with you, and also go eventually maybe tell somebody else how refreshed they were by conversation that they had with you. Um, I know that's not always going to be the case. You may not make that big of a splash with somebody when you have a conversation with them, but evidently Philemon has. So he evidently had some sort of personality about him that was just remarkable in the sense that it was something that people would comment on when they interacted with somebody else. Especially if they had two people that knew Philemon, one person would say to the other, wow, Philemon, he did this, or he did this, or he did this. The other person would say, yeah, he did that to me too, he was pretty cool. So again, Philemon is really being emphasized here by Paul as being someone that's just really cool to hang around with. Um, so he's going to be an interesting person uh, someday for us to, to talk to and to be in heaven someday. So, uh, yeah, it says up at the very beginning of this verse, for we have great joy and consolation in your love. Um, I had put in my notes that a Christian's joy in trying circumstances is a testimony to God's peace in their life. So it Paul is saying, you know, we have great joy and consolation that you are so loving because of the hearts of other saints that say they have been refreshed by you. That's essentially what Paul is saying here. So again, great things being shared about by we. Verse 8 and 9. Therefore, though I might be very bold in Christ to command you what is fitting, yet for love's sake I rather appeal to you, being such a one as Paul, the aged, and now also a prisoner of Jesus Christ. So here is about to come the first challenge for Philemon. He's going to hear a request uh, from Paul. And again, Paul is uh, really working Philemon here, really lifting him up. Paul is saying also, I'm a prisoner and I'm old. He says, the agent. So he may just be referring to himself as more of like the elder, or he may also be referring to his age. Um, so he is uh, getting older, probably in his late 50s, early, I think by the time he was actually martyred, I think he was around 62-ish. Um, so he was, which was not necessarily old for that time, but it, it, he had a rough life. Um, so he, as you can tell by reading in so many other books, and Corinthians, for instance, it mentions a lot of different things that Paul had been through. The multiple shipwrecks, multiple beatings with rip, whips and rods, and um, bitten by a snake, and um, being, 
I've said shipwrecks, but being lost at sea for days on end, two or three, four days, uh, just, and then everywhere he went, just like everybody back in these days, had to walk. Um, so that was very strenuous work, and so you know, being 60 years old back then was a lot different than 60-year-old nowadays in the sense of the physical activity that it took you to get to be 60-year-olds and just to make it through the harsh, harsher environment and you know, not, not having the medicine that we have nowadays. So Paul is getting ready for the big ask. And Paul is saying, I'm a prisoner, I'm old, I'm aged. Um, so how is Philemon supposed to say no to this guy? <laughs> he knows who Paul is. Um, so Paul says he could command Philemon to do what Paul is going to ask, but he would much rather appeal to Philemon that Philemon would do this favor willingly. So it's always much better if we can convince somebody to do, some, to do something willingly without having to coerce them. And that's why you know, Paul is doing, or saying the things that he's saying in this, uh, this personal, private letter to Philemon. All right, so verse 10 and 11. Paul goes on, he says, I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, whom I have begotten while in my chains, who once was unprofitable to you, but now is profitable to you and to me. So the word, his name, Onesimus, actually means useful. So if you kind of looked up the definition of this word in their time, Onesimus actually means useful. So Paul knew that, and he's kind of using kind of a play on words here in this verse. So Paul was um, using Onesimus' name and saying the things that he was saying in this verse because he might have been saying that at one point, Onesimus was unprofitable or unuseful to you. Uh, he may have thought that, you know, having Onesimus as a slave, uh, again, I don't know how well Paul may have known Onesimus before coming to Rome, but just the fact that um, he used this play on words, he was essentially saying that Onesimus was unuseful to you, but now I'm claiming that because he's a fellow brother in Christ, that now he is useful to you. So now he's really living up to his name. He's useful to me because now he's a brother in Christ. He's here. He's serving me. He's partaking in ministry. And now he's, I'm sending him back to you where he can also now again be in, uh, useful to you, living up to Again, his name, which means useful. It's a little bit of a play on words there that Paul is using. So verse 12 and 13. I am sending him back, referring to Onesimus. You therefore receive him, that is, that is my own heart, whom I wish to keep with me, that on your behalf he might minister to me in my chains for the gospel. So Paul was saying that he really wanted to keep Onesimus there with him. Meaning because if Philemon was actually there in Rome, like Onesimus was, if Philemon were there, he would probably be helping and serving Paul in some way, just as Onesimus is. So since Onesimus is already there, and he had just got, got to say, Paul could continue to teach him and use him in ministry. Um, it would be nice just to keep Onesimus in Rome and not send him back to Philemon. That's kind of what he's saying here uh, in my words versus way, just kind of re re rewording uh, the way Paul said it. So Paul just really didn't want Philemon to treat Onesimus anymore as a runaway slave. He wanted him to really understand that he can be and should be more useful to you than ever before. Um, so that's kind of what I got out of those two verses. Verse 14. But without your consent, I wanted to do nothing, that your good deed might not be by compulsion, as it were, but volunteer. So without having permission to kind of keep Onesimus in Rome, Paul just went ahead and sent Onesimus back on his thousand mile journey back to Colossae, back to Philemon. So Philemon's good deed that Paul is kind of asking for of receiving and accepting Onesimus had to be voluntary. So Paul knows that that's the only way it's going to work well if Philemon is open 
to receiving Onesimus voluntarily and not by any command of the, the, the agent, the elder, Paul, commanding him in a letter. Uh, none of us take well to being commanded to do anything, do we? Uh, that probably puts up our defenses pretty quick when somebody really forcefully tries us to tell us to tell us to do something. So Paul wasn't trying to do that at all. You see, he could command Philemon to do that, but he didn't want to do that. He wanted Philemon to, to understand the nature of who Onesimus now is. He's not just a runaway slave. He's somebody that you should pay more attention to, take care of, to understand that he's a brother in Christ now, as we all are. So Philemon's good deed of receiving and accepting Onesimus had to be voluntary. Just like our acceptance of Christ needs to be voluntary, not forced or under coercion. Um, there's, as you went through this, if you were to study this chapter on your own, you could probably go through several different passages or verses in this small book and kind of relate back to a picture of the gospel, a picture of receiving Christ Jesus. Uh, there's a lot of um, similarities or not any windows, but comparisons, I guess you could draw from some of these passages on how similar what Paul is asking of Philemon is what God is asking of us on how we should um, be receptive and forgiving uh, of, our, of our fellow brothers and sisters, essentially. Um, so yeah, there was quite a few different uh, parallels, I guess you could say, on the, between what Paul is asking here of Philemon and the gospel being shared essentially by Paul. Verses 15 and 16. For perhaps he departed for a while for this purpose, that you might receive him forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to you, to me, but how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. Paul is saying that perhaps in God's sovereignty that Philemon could now receive Onesimus back eternally and not just temporally. So obviously, temporarily, meaning he's going to receive a, a human being back, uh, a runaway slave back, to go back into his workforce, if that's what he chooses to do. So that's receiving him back temporarily. Um, but Paul is saying, you know, look at this from the bigger picture. Uh, look at now again, as I've said before, you're receiving back another fellow brother in Christ. Someone like me, Paul, someone like you, Philemon, receive Onesimus in a way honoring the Lord that he is going to be in heaven someday just the same as you and I are. That's kind of what Paul is kind of communicating here to Philemon. Again, really trying to make him understand that he's not just a runaway slave anymore, although he is temporary. So, essentially, Paul is saying here that it was God's plan that Onesimus would run away. I mean, for this purpose, Onesimus ran away, and he ended up running directly into the arms, into the area where Paul got a hold of him, shared the gospel, and he ended up coming to a faith in Jesus Christ. So there's a great challenge here of forgiveness for Philemon to wrestle with. So we don't know if this has happened before to Philemon or not, if he's ever had a runaway slave return to him. Uh, I'm sure most slave owners have had to deal with this at one point or another, so I'm sure as a slave, it was common practice to try and get away, to run away. Uh, if they knew there was some place that they knew it could go and be somehow free, uh, I'm sure it was a common practice to get run away, but then also get caught and have them to be returned. So we don't know if this has happened with Philemon before or not, but Paul is just, uh, again, reiterating the importance of accepting Onesimus as a fellow brother in Christ. The forgiveness that Paul is asking of Philemon is also something that we all have to wrestle with, and I'm sure we all have at some point in our life. Uh, maybe somebody stole something from you at some point in your life. Uh, maybe there was a, a prodigal child of yours uh, when they left. Maybe they took something much more than what they were supposed to take with them. Uh, maybe they've come back, maybe they haven't. Uh, you could probably fill in the blank on the many different situations or situations where you've had to exhibit forgiveness to another brother, another sister, maybe in Christ or not in Christ, and how you handled that situation was a good uh, test of our character and our morals and how much we truly 
believe in what we read in Scripture. And that's again what Paul is emphasizing, emphasizing here to Philemon, that hey, Philemon, you're going to really need to practice what you preach. Now, how well are you going to be able to forgive or miss this for him running away, especially now that you know he's accepted Christ as you and I have. This is like me talking, like, like, like Paul is talking. Verse 17 and 18. If then you count me as a partner, receive him as you would me. But if he has wronged you or owes you anything, put that on my account. Paul is saying that if we, Paul and Philemon, are in fellowship together, that really Philemon should accept Onesimus back, just as Philemon would accept Paul into his home. So he's wanting Philemon to treat Onesimus just as if it was he himself, Paul, coming back into uh, fellowship, coming back into Philemon's home. That's how much of an equal Philemon wants to think of, or Paul wants Philemon to think of Onesimus as. And because it is likely that Onesimus stole something from Philemon, as we mentioned before when he ran away, Paul says, put whatever that amount is onto my account. So most likely, whatever it was that Philemon may have stole, that had some value to it. But then also that whole time that Philemon was away from, I'm sorry, Onesimus was away from Philemon, away in Rome, that's a thousand mile journey. I don't know how long that may have taken to just get there, spend time in Rome, and then travel all the way back a thousand miles. Or even if you, was, if you were doing nothing but walking, I think a good pace is maybe like 20 miles a day. So that would take a long time getting there, spending time in Rome, and coming all the way back. So all that time, Paul might be saying, the work that Onesimus made, that should have, he should have been doing during all that time, that's the value that Philemon missed out on. So Paul may have also been saying, put that on my account as well. Because as a slave, they were supposed to be doing work for their, their, their master, their slave owner, and that was income, for lack of a better term, that Philemon was missing out on. So Paul may have even been saying, put that on my account too, as well as whatever Onesimus may have stolen from me. Verse 19. I, Paul, am writing with my own hand. I will repay, not to mention to you that you owe me even your own self besides. So we've, we've seen it in another letter as well, where sometimes Paul closes by saying, I'm writing to you in my own hand. Uh, again, we believe that Paul had an issue with his eyes, not exactly sure what it might have been, but he probably didn't see well, so his handwriting was usually much larger than a common scribe may have written his words down in for him. Uh, so if he was writing it in his own, instead of letters being this tall on the parchment, they may have been this tall on the parchment. Something like that. It's very obvious that Paul wrote the letter is kind of what he's saying here. So, you know, again, Paul keeps working Philemon even more here. Um, he says, I'm writing, uh, I will repay, not to mention to you that you owe me even your own self. So this is kind of where the illusion is that Paul, at some point in time in the past, actually ended up leading Philemon to the Lord. Because of I led you to the Lord. You owe me such a, a great favor for introducing you to the Lord Jesus Christ that you should be even more willing to accept Onesimus back into the fold, essentially is what Paul is trying to say. In verse 20 and 21. Yes, brother, let me have joy from you in the Lord. Refresh my heart in the Lord, having confidence in your obedience more than I say. So finally, Paul asked from Philemon, that he might be refreshed and have joy too in the Lord because of Philemon expressing his love to Onesimus, also just as Philemon expresses his love towards others that Paul has mentioned uh, earlier in the text. The way this last part of like verse 21 kind of closes, having confidence in your obedience, I write to you knowing that you will do even more than I say. Uh, that kind of spoke to me in the sense that it was kind of like the presumptive clause that you kind of hear a lot of salespeople use, 
that they're really, when they're trying, when a salesperson is trying to sell something to somebody, they kind of almost put words in the person's mouth by saying out loud what they want that person to, to do. So Paul is saying, I have confidence that you're just going to receive Onesimus and do even more than what I'm saying. So that's kind of Paul being the salesperson here. So Paul is pumping up Philemon again by saying what Paul really hopes Philemon will do. So Paul might be saying, don't just receive Onesimus back without punishment. So that was perfectly within his right probably as a slave owner is to, yes, receive Onesimus back. But it was probably perfectly within his right to punish Onesimus for having left and having run away. But Paul is saying, receive him back without punishment and maybe even set him free. That's kind of what Paul is maybe alluding to here, that you will do even more than I say. So again, that's not something that a Christian slave, that's not something that a slave owner would need to do, but Paul is kind of emphasizing that as a Christian slave owner, Maybe you should be at a little bit held at a little bit higher accountability level. And maybe do something more than what the typical slave owner would do. So, come towards the end here, verse 22. But meanwhile, also prepare a guest room for me. For I trust that through your prayers I shall be granted to you. So one last time, Paul is pretty amazing here. He requ requests a guest room be prepared for him to stay in. So apparently he knew of the prayers of what's happening in Philemon's house. He had been praying for Paul this whole time that they knew he's been away in Rome and in prison. And many other people have been praying for Paul as well. So he's again saying, because of your prayers, I know you've been lifting me up. I expect, fully expect that God is going to set me free from my, my chains here in Rome, and when I'm set free, I'm going to come to you and see how it's been working out with you and Onesimus, and I expect that to happen soon, so have a room prepared for me. That's, that's kind of bold on a person's part. That's like me saying, Todd, hey, I'm going to be uh, over at your house Thursday night. Uh, be ready for me. <laughs> see you then. Um, something like that. It's, it's sort of. But back in the day, I mean, a lot of people were supposed to be more uh, accommodating putting people up in their homes a lot more than we typically do nowadays. Uh, but that's kind of what Paul is saying here. Is prepare a room for me. I expect to be set for you soon, and I'm coming to see you. So that was pretty cool. Uh, 23 to 25. Epaphras, my fellow prisoner in Christ Jesus, greets you, as do Mark, Aristarchus, Demas, Luke, my fellow laborers. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit. Amen. So Paul just lets Philemon know that all of Paul's buddies are present with him in Rome when they greet you, Philemon, and they know what the contents of this letter are all about. So basically he's saying, see you soon. Um, and he's just kind of, again, letting, him, letting people know that Paul has got people there that are serving with him, uh, performing ministry duties there. Mark, Aristocritus, uh, Demas, and Luke, as well as Onesimus, has been there as well, helping out Paul. So that's the end of this um, short book. And the New Testament, elsewhere, uh, doesn't really reveal what finally happened to Onesimus. We don't really know the, the rest of the story, as Paul Harvey would say. Uh, but some have taken him to be the actual Onesimus, who eventually became the bishop of Ephesus mentioned by Ignatius in the early 2nd century. So that was pretty cool. I, I saw that in my study Bible, that it's possible that the same Onesimus, a runaway slave, was treated well by Philemon and ended up becoming a bishop at one of the churches in Ephesus. How cool would that be if that's the same person? So we see Paul sent Onesimus back to Philemon, hopefully for forgiveness and restoration to take place. This was something slave owners of the day did not have to do, but Christian slave owners, as I mentioned, like Philemon, were held to a higher calling. So, some questions to kind of ask of ourselves. If you were Philemon, kind of put yourself in his shoes, could you forgive Onesimus for what he did? Can you just forgive in general 
when something maybe not as dire as this took place, but something else in your life is taking place, have you been as forgiving as you thought you might be in that situation? Have you had a situation come up where, in hindsight, you look back and say, wow, I really dropped the ball there. I was not as forgiving as I should have been. I'm sure we can all say that has happened in our life. Can you go to the one who can forgive all? Hopefully all of us here in this room are, have already made that step. We've asked Jesus into our heart to be our Lord and Savior. But we can go to Him every day, whenever we need to, and ask for forgiveness. And that's something that we should do. Because, you know, we've heard it preached from stage many times. We are still sinners. Uh, hopefully we don't commit the same sin over and over. We're not living in sin. We're just accidentally sometimes do sinful things. Um, so we need to ask forgiveness often. So can we and do we go and ask forgiveness from the Lord as we should? Do we have gracious spirits in our hearts, in our, in our actions? Do we portray being um, gracious to those that we need to be gracious to? Uh, sometimes it's easy. Sometimes it's not so easy. So those times when it's not so easy is when we really have, again, a, a test of our character, as Paul was really trying to point out to Philemon. Hey, Philemon, this is going to be a test for you. I understand that. And I'm kind of prompting you with this letter to think deep about how you respond when you see your missus walk into your house this next time, whenever it's going to be. So he's just kind of prompting Philemon and saying, how gracious are you going to be with this person? So those are kind of some questions I wanted you to, to think about ourselves. You know, kind of putting this into application. Can you forgive? Can you go to the one who can forgive us? Do you go to him asking for forgiveness? And do you have a gracious spirit? And I want to kind of close with a, a story that I, I, I heard, again, through one of the pastors that I heard teaching through this book when I was studying. Um, it was a story from a pastor of a missionary and this missionary was serving in Iraq. And while this missionary was in Iraq, he came across this young lady, he called her a girl, that was helping out in Iraq. And essentially, this girl would go in, and she was part of a missionary organization, but this missionary just became familiar with this, this one girl for whatever reason. And he's now back at his home church, in Pennsylvania, sharing with his pastor, and this pastor is the one I'm hearing the story from. So this missionary reported of this girl that was would go into the stone homes because most of all the homes there in Iraq were basically built out of stone or masonry type structures, not wood and everything that you know Mike builds the houses out of nowadays is, is made out of stone. Um, but there were often many situations, as we've heard in the news, of um, radical Islamists and Muslims going through certain areas in Iraq and murdering families, individuals. Usually, a lot of times, the families would be in their homes and they would be murdered there. And this missionary group, when the bad guys would go in and do the bad things that they did, and then they would move out and move on, this missionary group would move into that city or at least into that place where that family or individual was murdered and this girl in this ministry group would clean the houses. They would go in and they would sterilize and clean the blood out from these stone houses. And then a lot of times the windows and the doors would be damaged or destroyed so they would also replace the windows and replace the doors so that these homes could now again be livable and not have the mess that was kind of left behind by the bad guys. And that's how this missionary came in contact with this girl. So, again, back in Pennsylvania, where this pastor was at, in Lancaster, Pennsylvania, years ago, there was a murder of several girls in a local school that this pastor had remembered. And what was unique about this story was these, I think it was three girls from one family were all murdered in the school. The, 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 the murderer was caught and convicted and sent to prison. 
and this family of the three murdered girls went to prison often and prayed for and with this murderer, the person that killed the girls. And then once this hit the news, this made it around the world through all the different news outlets that this family was going to prison and praying for this person that had killed their, their, three, their daughters, essentially. So this story spread around the world, as I mentioned, and the missionary again is mentioning this to the pastor, and he was also saying that Iraqis several years ago um, were, they're, they're just, they have just been in practice over hundreds, if not thousands of years, of the moderate Muslims have been, for whatever reason, often killed by the radical Muslims there in Iraq. And the Iraqis didn't know how this family could do what they were doing. You know, again, they heard about the story of this family praying for a murderer, and these Iraqis have been so hardened and calloused that they just didn't know how, how can a family do that? How can they not have hate and vindictive sentiments in their heart towards that murderer? They're there praying for them? Oh my gosh, how can they do that? Is kind of what this missionary was hearing. So they told this missionary, the people in Iraq told this missionary, we don't know how to forgive. Can someone come here and teach us to forgive? And essentially that's why this girl came from Lancaster, Pennsylvania with this ministry group to go to Iraq. Her missionary group, or his, her mission was to just clean homes. But during that time there, she was able to minister to all the different Iraqi families. Because again, guess what they're going through? They're going through the grief of some of their families possibly that just got killed or murdered. They were the survivors. How can they get by and learn to forgive those that had killed some friends or family members. So that was kind of how the story kind of went full circle in the sense that the girl that this Iraqi missionary became friends with came back to his home church and learned why that girl was actually sent there in the first place. Um, it was all about trying to teach Iraqis on how to forgive. And it wasn't that dramatic of a story here with Philemon having to forgive Onesimus for something that drastic, but still it was something that Philemon had to learn to do maybe, was to be forgiving. And again, a couple of questions that I asked you a minute ago was how forgiving have you been in the past? Can you maybe be more forgiving? Can I be more forgiving in the future? There's always going to be some circumstance still coming tonight maybe, tonight when you go home, Sunday when you come to church, there's going to be an opportunity probably to be forgiving towards someone else. So maybe think of this, this book. It's a, a little bit of a story about forgiveness. Or maybe remember this story. So the life lesson that I wanted to close with is, this is earth, it ain't heaven. We need to be forgiving, not just forgiving. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we again thank you for our time together. We thank you for this short book and the probably many, many different things that could be brought out from its words. Lord, I'm sure I just brought out a few. Um, so Lord, I pray that maybe others will uh, study this book on their own and learn more about it. But Lord, we just uh, thank you for the message of the gospel that Paul is trying to share with Philemon. But also the, the act of forgiveness that Paul was trying to uh, put into Philemon's heart. That he would be willing and receptive towards the missus. So Lord, help us to also be more forgiving in our lives. And uh, Lord, just bless our time together as brothers in Christ. Help us to, to recognize that we all have different situations and things going on in our life. Um, that we need to be forgiving of others and maybe forgiving of one another uh, at some point in time in our fellowship uh, here together. So Lord, just bless and encourage each and every man here tonight, Lord, and protect us as we leave and go our separate ways tonight. And Lord, maybe we see each other soon in the hallways here at church. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen.